Hey everybody, wow, it is hot, but it is beautiful out here on July 3rd, 2020 for Gettysburg 157. I'll bet some of you already know where we are. Yes, we are on the field of Pickett's Charge or the field of Pickett Pettigrew Trimble Assault or the field of Longstreet's Assault. Either way, we're between the lines at Gettysburg with the Confederate lines off to your right and the Union fish hook lines off to your left. And we're gonna get into a little bit more detail about this. We're gonna walk some of this field along the middle and then head up to the final spot. Uh, we've got some artifacts along the way and a guest or two and the voice of, voice of Chris White behind the camera. So first, you know, let me just set things up a little bit because people think of this as the field of Pickett's Charge, but long before that, it is of course not only farmer's fields, but on July 2nd, 1863, this is the scene of a big and heavy fight too. Not exactly where we stand, but just beyond me is where the second day's fight on the south end culminates. Let me explain. On July 2nd, 1863, John Bell Hoods, Texans, Georgians, Arkansans, Alabamians, launched the attack on the far side, about two miles south of here. After them, uh, McLaws' soldiers, again, South Carolinians, Mississippians, and Georgians, launch a massive attack toward the Peach Orchard along the Emmitsburg Road. And then, Anderson's division. We're starting to get into where we can see the action there. The most distant woods over there is where Anderson's, Floridians, Alabamians, and Georgians are gonna leave that area. They're gonna charge all the way across this field here. The Georgians, not far off here, going all the way across this field, uh, all the way over to the Union position, okay? And the Union position is over there. You can see it from here. You can see that it's a ridge. It goes way down and back up towards Cemetery Ridge. And you might be able to see the largest clump of trees over there. A truck just passed in front of it. And either way, trust me, it's the largest clump of seven or eight trees. That's the copse of trees, the clump of trees, also known as the high water mark. Um, and we'll be over there before too long, so we'll show you in more detail. On July 2nd and 3rd, the Union soldiers are over there, okay? On the 2nd, they repulsed the Confederates because no Confederates attacked here. Wright's men fell back. On July 3rd, I think you know the story already, there's three big groups. You got Pickett's Virginians lined up in front of the most distant trees you see over there. Then you've got Pettigrew's division. This is a group of Tennessee, Alabama, a lot of North Carolinians and Virginians coming up here, supported sort of by a Demi division um, under Isaac Trimble. Um, they are going to all advance across the field, some straight across with Pickett's guys coming across, and I think you know the story. So before we really follow the fighting, and we're going to walk across the field, um, let me bring on Wayne Motz. He's CEO of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, but also author of Pickett's Charge, a guide to the most famous attack in American history, which, which what I think, um, along with Jim Hessler, he wrote that is the standard work on Pickett's Charge. Wayne, what's going on? Thanks a lot for the shout out, Gary. We appreciate it. And to our colleague who isn't here, Jim Hessler. This is a desk piece from the National Civil War Museum's collection that was a presentation piece, presentation piece to be given to Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fremantle of Her Majesty's Coldstream Guards. And this presentation piece was put together by Major John J. Clark. He was an engineer on General Longstreet's staff. And for those of you that know the Battle of Gettysburg history, you know Clark was involved in the reconnaissance for July 2nd with Robert E. Lee's engineer, Samuel Johnston. So that's a name that probably a lot of people hear about. Who was Arthur Fremantle? Arthur Fremantle was an English observer here in the Battle of Gettysburg with Robert E. Lee. Now, Robert E. Lee had an observer not only from England, but he had a foreign observer from Austria. He also had a foreign observer from Prussia. But Fremantle wrote an account called Three Months in the Southern States. And he enters the South down at Matamoros, across from Brownsville, Texas, comes into Texas, travels, and gets up to Robert E. Lee's headquarters on the 22nd of June, 1863, and he meets General Longstreet on the 27th of June, and he also meets Major Clark, who is listed on this particular desk piece. And he stays with Robert E. Lee's army here in the Battle of Gettysburg, and then he leaves Robert E. Lee's army on July 7th, 1863, to go back uh, to England. Uh, he's an assistant military secretary at Gibraltar. He's got a very long and distinguished career. His father was a major general in the army. But this piece, I think, is made from an artillery round. You can see this is an actual artillery fragment piece here. And this was made to be given to Fremantle. I'm not sure he ever actually got this because he left the army, of course, uh, very, very quickly. But an original item made to be presented to our English observer here in the Battle of Gettysburg, right over here to the right of your screen over my left shoulder on July 3rd, 1863. And believe it or not, Chris and Gary, that's right 
right now, 157 years ago, during when the cannonade would have been. So, Gary? Wow, it's special being out here right at the actual time uh, when this happened. We're going to hook up with Wayne a little bit later. Uh, while the American Battlefield Trust, Chris White behind the camera, and I are going to walk across these fields. Now, note that at Gettysburg 155 and on numerous videos, and then on Gettysburg 156, we have walked across this field. We've walked all around the angle. We're trying to do something different. We're going to move laterally across it here. And here we are, starting somewhere near the middle, the Bliss Farm. And the Bliss Farm is seen of intense fighting on July 2nd. Uh, Bliss's barn will burn. Chris is going to talk about that. And then there will be a lot going on here on July 3rd. Chris? Yeah, so this is an often overlooked spot on the Gettysburg Battlefield. And I want to thank everybody for watching today. I do want to mention, if this uh, if this stream kind of goes out from here from time to time, we are videoing this the whole way across the field. We will post it later. So don't worry. You're going to be covered one way or the other. But um, what you're looking at right now is what, what the remnants of the Bliss Farm uh, would be. You'll notice a few monuments out here, a few Union monuments to the 14th Connecticut, to the 12th New Jersey. Now this was a farm owned by William and Adeline Bliss during the time of the American Civil War. Mr. Bliss will, uh, is a Massachusetts native. He moves down to Bradford County, Pennsylvania, up to, uh, up to um, Chautauqua, New York, uh, Chautauqua County, New York, then down here to Gettysburg in 1857 when he buys uh, 44 acres on what becomes the Gettysburg Battlefield. He's gonna buy a house, some outbuildings, it has two good wells on it. He's gonna bring two of his daughters down here, Sarah and Agnes, and they will live here and have a, a very nice library, apparently. Over the next few years, he'll add to his land, his land holdings, and then he will put up at a substantial 75 by 33 foot barn. And if you wanna learn more about the Bliss Farm, see John Archer's great book called Fury at the Bliss Farm. It's small, but it's a well-written read. Um, and what will end up happening is Union soldiers will come from Cemetery Ridge. They are commanded by Alexander Hayes, Fighting Alec. He's a Pittsburgher, uh, just like me, and Fighting Alec is going to see this white house out here, which once stood right around where we are, and he's going to call it that damned little white house over and over again because uh, we'll have some North Carolinians under Alfred Scales come out here, and then eventually Mississippians under Carnot Posey. About a thousand of them will come out here. The F Bliss Farm buildings will change hands 10 different times during the battle. Uh, William and Adeline Bliss will not be here during the battle. They'll be here on July 1st. They'll get word from the McMillans, uh, who live just in the next house up, up the ridge, that something's going on. Their two daughters from the McMillan farm come down here. They get the two uh, Bliss girls. They take them over to one of the Weikert farms over on the Tawny Town Road. They get out of here, and when the Confederates and Union arrive, they notice that the uh, table had been set uh, kind of like the Trosa farm for them, and everything had been left just the way it was. So the, the Bliss Farm would have sat out here. There's going to be intense fighting on July 2nd and 3rd. At one point, Alexander Hayes will ride out here onto the division skirmish line. Clinton McDougal, the colonel of the 125th New York, will say that's the only time he ever saw a general officer out on the skirmish line. And Fighting Alec is going to try to inspire his men. But over the next two days, this farm will change hands time and time again. New Jerseyans. Uh, New Yorkers will be out here, uh, men from the Nutmeg State, Mississippians. It's going to be a, a, a nasty fight. And finally, on July 3rd, two different men are given orders to burn the Bliss Farm. They have had enough. So they'll come out here, and they will burn the, burn the buildings to the ground using hay, paper cartridges, and other things to ignite the fire. And there's one of the monuments out here that tells you it has a tree foil of the second core on it, but it tells you this is the center of the site of the Bliss House, captured and burned by the 14th Connecticut Volunteers, July 3rd, 1863. So yeah, right in the middle of the fields of Pickett's Charge, we have a number of different monuments, this one being to the Bliss Farm, kind of. Um, and later on in life, the Bliss Farm will be used uh, as part of Camp Colt, which is a training facility in 1918, headed by a captain named Dwight David Eisenhower. He is going to uh, train the tank training corps right out in the fields that you see in front of us. Here's Ike with the only tank he has here. He's going to receive it on June 6th of 1918. If you know anything about June 6th, that's a pretty famous date for Ike a few years later in 1944. He gets this tank, and then they decide they're going to drive it all over the battlefield. And what they're going to do is drive it right down here to the Bliss Farm, and they're going to drive it over top of the old farm berm, which you might be able to see here just behind the monuments. So we'll take a walk past this, but that's the old uh, berm from the old bank barn here. 
So the military will use that as a training for their Renault tank that they have here out on the Gettysburg battlefield. And they're gonna use the Bliss Farm for training, mainly for the Signal Corps to take a lot of pictures of their brand new toy. Up until this time, the tra Tank Training Corps had absolutely no tanks. They build one of their own. They're gonna call it the Tin Liz or Battle in Lizzie, and that's what it looks like. It's a Mark V tank that is actually gonna be made out of aluminum and sitting on a car chassis. Uh, so you gotta make do with what, what you have here. This will be Eisenhower's first true field command here at Gettysburg in 1918. Super cool, Crescent. I thought you were gonna start talking about Thin Lizzy, my favorite group from the 19, late 70s when I, saw the, when I saw them open up for Queen. No joke, 1977. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. We are on the field of Pickett's Charge, if that's what we're allowed to call it. Um, you can call it the Pitt, Pickett, Pettigrew, Trimble Assault, or Longstreet's Assault as well. We see hundreds of you watching right now, but ultimately thousands of people watch these because you share it with your friends, so please do that. We're looking toward the Confederate line now and we're on the Bliss Farm and what I wanted to add I could hardly add anything to everything Chris said but you know there's something about the Blisses you know I think often people talk about the Southerners and their particular love for their country and that is true but you have it in the North too you have Yankees who are offended at the idea of disunion and many of the soldiers who say why they fought and by the way there are thousands of reasons why soldiers on both sides fought you know talked about how offended they were at undoing that which the founding fathers had created and William Bliss was one of those and he said if he had a thousand such farms to give to this union he would and I don't even think he applied um, for reparations for this uh, you know or uh, yes he did Chris is nodding behind the camera I don't think he wanted to apply for any of this so. he applied he, he uh, it was three thousand five hundred and twenty some odd dollars he didn't get one cent from Uncle Sam but he did get a thousand dollars from Nicholas Cadori in October of 1863 who buys his farm from him and Mr. Bliss and his family head back to New York uh, I was just about to say that Chris you should have given me another second uh, to go around uh, no this is great so again we're, we've changed perspectives a little bit but notice even on this seemingly flat field I'm having more trouble seeing the Confederate line over there right that's where the North Carolinians and Virginians are really gonna be that is Brock and Browse Virginians as I look over there I can see the Virginia Memorial and I can look beyond it to where Pickett's division was just by moving over a little suddenly I have a great view toward just over the tops so I might have been able to see some of the tops of the bayonets of some of the Virginia men right over there and on July 3rd 1863 you know what happens there's a huge bombardment going across this field and unlike today there is absolutely no wind it is very windy right now by the way we have a windscreen on you should see how many windscreens we bring with you I think we found the right one because it doesn't seem to sound windy um, and there's a huge bombardment because of all of the because there's no wind the smoke just sits there both sides can't see what they're shooting at maybe because of an inferiority of southern fuses they are flying harmlessly over the Union position and the Yankees are still going to have 50, 80 guns, depending on how you count it, over there, plus 5,000 rifles ready for the Confederates when they start to walk across these fields. These fields, these very fields, which is what we're doing. What do we have here, Chris? Oh, I just didn't want you to trip over the marker. Okay, good. It's so there. Old, it's the 14th Connecticut marker. So you can see that it's probably hit once or twice by a brush hog, but uh, it's still out here. It reminds me, I don't think I've told the story before, but way back in my wee early research days at the uh, um, National Archives, somebody asked me to look up their ancestor. And they had a piece of paper that, they had a picture of him, and his face, the photo was all messed up because his face had scratches all over it, so I couldn't really tell. In any case, I looked him up, he was in the 14th Connecticut, and there was a little diagram in there, and it showed a Confederate shell hitting the stone wall right over there, by the way. Across the way is where the 14th Connecticut Monument will be, somewhere right up in that direction, okay? And they showed a Confederate shell coming in, hitting the wall, and spraying rock all over his face. It turns out the photo was fine. His face was so scarred up that it looked like there was a problem with the photograph. The only time I've seen such a drawing in a pension record at the National Archives, and also speaks to how everybody, all the 12,500 Confederates in this charge and all the 5,000 Union soldiers over there opposing them and all the 20 or 30,000 reinforcements that come to the center to support the Union repulse um, of the Confederates they all have their own story um, so we are walking in a way that none of the soldiers did. We're walking obliquely across the field. We are traversing Pettigrew's units. And at this point, Pettigrew, his North Carolinians, some of his Alabamians and Mississippi soldiers might have been able to look to their right, that's over there, and they might be able to see some of Pickett's Virginians over that rise, maybe not yet. And they would have certainly seen Little Round Top. It's right behind that tree um, off in the distance. So if Chris could come over to the right, we'll get our first views of Little Round Top. Luckily for the North Carolinians, they are largely out of range. 
range of first the six, then the five, then the four, then just the one cannon that was able to fire at the Confederates as they advanced. But unfortunately for Pickett's men, Garnett, Armistead, Kemper, those guns were able to reach the Virginians as they are crossing the field over here. Now, let me pause for a second here, A, to see if Chris has anything to add, but let's stop for a sec, Chris, and look over here to reassess the Union line. It's July 3rd. The bombardment has failed. Uh, a great moan had already gone up from the Union line because they saw the Confederates coming toward them like a parade ground. It was beautiful. Their flags flying in the air, and it was impossible to take in. The line was more than a mile wide, 12,500 soldiers, and it was supposedly beautiful until the long-range artillery fire, not from Little Round Top, but rather on the Union lines starts tearing gaps into the Confederate line here. And the Southern line will actually visibly shrink as it reaches the Emmitsburg Road, because if the guy next to you gets shot, you close up, you move over. And the line is shrinking. The Union is also preparing other things, has other things in mind to try to assist with this repulse. Chris? Hashtag Gary comes up for air. So that was uh, one sentence if you were keeping up with that one. Uh, uh, Gary, the, the one thing that I always notice walking across this field, I'm just gonna pan this way for a second, is that I can not see back to West Confederate Avenue at this point. So if I'm a Confederate who are on the far side of this ridge line, marching up towards the Union line, which is behind the camera, you're covered. Once you get to the top of that ridge line, you're gonna start to now be subjected to both small arms fire as well as artillery fire. So this field changes. It has its own personality, if you will, out here on the field to pick its charge. So if you ever get a chance to, if you're able to, you know, come out here and walk, even if you don't do the whole thing, there are different sections that you can walk out to and see. Now, the, the battlefield at, at, at Gettysburg is going to, you know, be used over time. And, and Gary knows that I, I have an affinity for not talking about the Civil War sometimes. I'll talk about other periods. But in 1922, one of the, some of the coolest pictures I've ever seen of the Gettysburg Battlefield were taken then in July of 1922 when the Marine Corps comes here and they reenact Pickett's Charge. They actually landed bombers. Yes, I guess Robert E. Lee had bombers. Over this ridge line, they're going to set up 75 millimeter howitzers. They have barrage balloons up. My favorite picture is of a barrage balloon blowing up and the guy parachuting out of it uh, over top of the Gettysburg Battlefield. That would have taken place right out in front of us. But the, the Marines will lay down smoke. They'll go across. They'll fight at the angle at Pickett's Charge. They'll also set up the White House here. President Harding was invited to come up. Uh, because this is a time when we're trying to decide what should we keep in the military? What should we fund? There's this new fangled thing called an Air Force. The Navy wants more money. So the Marines are trying to get as much money as they can and stay in existence. So we're going to put on pageantry, not just here, but at Antietam in the wilderness as well. Good, good. And you know, this field, this is federal land. So it was not only a tank training corps. You've got German POWs here during World War II. You've got trains going across here. You've got Civil War veterans encamped on the field over here. So lots going on. And you're with the American Battlefield Trust and we see hundreds of you. This is our most visited live so far, but there will be thousands watching it, especially if you share it with your friends so as many people can see it as possible. Seeing a lot of good friends of ours. Uh, my good friend, uh, Jamie Reif from H SJR Research in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania says actually he's seen a lot of drawings of woundings uh, in the pension records at the National Archives. I guess what I meant to say is I've only seen one and there's a guy named Mike, I think I can pronounce his name, Gorman, who wants us to talk about Richard Brooke Garnett, Chris. I thought it was Gourmand. Okay, it is Gourmand. He's Gourmand. a little bit French or something like that. Do you have anything to say about Garnett? Yeah, Dick Garnett is probably made famous to most Civil War buffs from the uh, uh, the movie Gettysburg, but Dick Garnett is going to come out to the American Civil War. He's the former commander of the Stonewall Brigade, and he really is going to take it on the chin from Stonewall Jackson, who blames him for the May March 23rd, 1862 loss at, at Kernstown. It really has nothing to do with Garnett. It's a bad position, but Stonewall Jackson, once you get onto his bad list, that's it. And Dick Garnett will come out here onto this battlefield, one of the three brigade commanders in George Pickett's division. Pickett technically has five brigades, but only three of them are here at Gettysburg. That'll be Kemper, Armistead, and Dick Garnett. Who's missing? Is it Corson Jenkins? You are correct. Wow, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so they are not up here uh, with us. So Garnett will actually go across the fields, and he is going to be sadly blown off of his horse and uh, essentially obliterated from his horse uh, by an artillery 
uh, round that is going to go off very close to him. Uh, supposedly, his sword and sa uh, sword and belt will show up at a pawn shop in Baltimore, Maryland, years after the war, even though his body is not identified amongst the Confederate dead. Yeah, I think that's on pretty good provenance from what little I understand about it. He also wasn't feeling well that day. Maybe that's why he's wearing the overcoat. You know, there's a lot of reasons why he might not have been ident unidentified. You know, maybe he was stripped at that point. And by the way, the one picture we have of him might not even be Garnett. So there's all there's more work to be done on Garnett on, on uh, Garnett Gorman. Uh, maybe we can all be part of this here. Uh, I see someone justice for Garnett. Oh no, I probably should have read that one out loud. Uh, people are saying all sorts of great things here, and we appreciate your comments. Uh, we are slim on staff right now, so I can't go through all of them. But we've got Houston, Texas. We've got uh, you know some other people saying some stuff. I'm not going to repeat right now, so I'll just keep talking about other things. Uh, and we appreciate this. Um, we appreciate you being with us. But look, as we walk, I can see again. Look, the famous Union masked batteries. Right, you can see the angle behind me at the higher points of Cemetery Ridge. But look off that way. Suddenly. You know, uh, some of Pettigrew's men, as we close on the Virginians, sort of, are not going to be under the harassing fire of the Union masked battery, the one you can't see. You might say it's in defilade or something like that. But all of these guys here are now getting dangerously close to the small arms range of the thousands of Union muskets that are over there. Note that there are fences separating the troops, and I don't care what documentary you've seen or what you might think. These are sturdy post and rail fences, and you do not just bowl these over, even if you have 50 or 80 guys. This, of course, I picked a on sturdy spot but you have to stop and disassemble it or you have to climb a fence and there are some especially sturdy ones coming up on the Emmitsburg Road over there um, and, and I would just add that some of these fences would be here in 68 July 3rd some are not here some would have turned uh, torn down on July 1st mr. McMillan to the north will take an axe out himself and help cut down his own fences to get the first corps up onto the first day's battlefield and then you also have fighting out here on July 2nd which will actually reach the angle that'll be Ambrose Wright's men uh, Georgians he will tell allegedly Edward Port Alexander it's not getting there it's staying there that is a problem indeed so let's set the stage a little bit here because I assume we're still on Pettigrew's line. In fact, if we were to look directly ahead, we'd see the advanced marker of the 26th North Carolina. You can't see it from there, but look for the most distant wall, and it's right up to it. That's about how far they got. So we are on Pettigrew's line. Off to the right here, there would be a break, sort of, because that's Pickett's Virginians kind of obliquing or moving their way. Specifically, if I may, you could say they're going obliquely, but what they're really doing is moving forward and then going like this and then forward and then like this so as to confuse the Union soldiers as to their true objective. What's their true objective? We argue about that a little bit, but it's largely that clump, or that largest clump of trees you see over there, known as the Cops of Trees or the Clump of Trees, and that's what they're all going to converge near. I don't think it matters. With a line a mile wide, they're going to hit somewhere on Cemetery Ridge if they are successful. Looking off in this direction, it's not just Pettigrew's old brigade here, um, you know, but commanded by, I think, Burkett D. Fry by that point, um, but you've also got um, additional guys under Trimble kind of guarding the end over there, but they're starting to melt away. You've got additional, um, you've got Joe Davis's brigade and other Confederates. So this is still a massive attack, and here they come, up toward these sturdy double fences of the Emmitsburg Road. The Union guns on Little Round Top are still telling, at least on the Virginians. We're probably just safe from there. You know, a parrot rifle up on a height might be able to reach two miles, maybe just over at a high arc, but they had plenty of targets closer, and I don't know that Pettigrew's guys were really getting hit. This was more of a suffering of the Virginians, especially Kemper's brigade on the far right. So here we are. Uh, Things are going to be getting particularly intense now. Two other things that are occurring, or three. One, George Gordon Meade has already realized this is where the attack's going to be. He already kind of realized that during the bombardment, he was not fooled by anything. And the night before, General Meade commanding the Union Army said, if Lee attacks tomorrow, Gibbon, it will be on your front. And that at least, you know, if he meant it and only said it to Gibbon, he outguessed Robert E. Lee. You could say Gibbon would be ready for him, okay? So Meade has begun to order what I call, and some people say I exaggerate this, but when you read the official records, Meade basically orders half the army to the center. You just start reading, they're all ordered to the center. So 20,000 at the minimum, I say as many as 30,000 soldiers, at least twice as many as were in the Confederate attack to start with to support the 5,000 Union soldiers already up here. Two. There's Ohio and New York soldiers over there on the far right, okay? Imagine beyond that white Abraham Bryan farm over there. Imagine some Ohio and New York troops bulging out to near what you now see as General Pickett's buffet over there, and they're gonna bulge out. So now the Confederates are gonna get flanked on their left. And then finally, who's gonna bulge out behind us there, Chris? Oh, it will be George Standard's Vermont Brigade. Yes, and I can see them up there. So now 
they bulge way out, Hancock's bulging them out, he actually gets shot in the process while he's ordering them forward, if you believe that he did that, and I do, so now the Confederates are advancing into what? A three-sided box, as Doug Dowds like to say. They are coming into this three-sided box, the Confederates will be flanked, but at this critical moment, I estimate that the Confederates are still more numerous than the Union soldiers. The 10, 20, 30,000 Union reinforcements have not yet arrived, okay? So the Confederates come up to the Emmitsburg Road. Many people don't know that Gettysburg does have a sunken road, and it's this one. Roads got started to sink from heavy use, and there's a fence on each side. It was thinner than it is today, and they are going to get in the bottom, and many Confederates do not want to leave. The very thing that, uh, you know, some commanders said, don't build earthworks, because they'll never fight from behind them. A lot of Confederates hunkered down in this road and didn't want to go any further. Chris? Yeah, I've always wondered what Robert E. Lee's problem was with that clump of trees so much, sending so many men to attack them. That's bad history jokes. Um, <laughs> as we come across here, one thing I always like to remind people, uh, when you come across here, number one, be careful crossing the Emmitsburg Road. But number two, you know, you'll see the tops of these monuments. Uh, the problem is you're not seeing the bottom of the monuments. So keep in mind that they might not be able to, the Union might not be able to see these Confederates and vice versa. So the topography is going to keep keep on changing. Now behind us, or in front of us, I should say, um, we'll have the Union lines. Uh, John Gibbon is back here with his men. You also have Alexander Hayes, who we talked about at the Bliss Farm. Now Hayes is going to tell his men to gather up any discarded uh, gun that they can find and start loading them and leaning them up against the wall. What he wants to do is be able to throw as much lead downrange as humanly possible. And at this point, you know, we are probably about 75 yards in to the, uh, uh, to the attack. We're about 75 yards into the Union line. So we're well within musket range, canister range. We're coming into the front of Alonzo Cushing's battery, which is being decimated up here. Cushing has an amazing story where he's gonna have his guns right up against the wall. He is gonna be wounded uh, severely, basically holding himself together uh, whenever he is gonna be shot through the mouth, killed right at the angle. He is the most recent recipient of the Medal of Honor for Gettysburg actions 150 years later. Well, and let me, that's great, Chris. So let me say that this is my idea to come across here. If your uh, speakers are crackling, it's because I said, hey, let's go across this uh, this area. This has nothing to do with the windscreen or anything like that. And since Chris brought up a bad history joke, let me say what Andrea, Andrea Lee Pike said. She said, once I asked a park ranger if the fence around the clops of trees was there to keep the trees from escaping. I'm not allowed to talk to park rangers anymore, she says. Way to go. Great comment there. And she's talking about the fence that is, of course, around the copse of trees. We have some famous fences here at Gettysburg, uh, one of you which used to surround Lafayette Park uh, outside, uh, uh, outside of the White House, of course, which is pretty interesting. So we've got famous monuments, famous fences, famous rocks, and famous people here. And here we come, crossing something that nobody would have done unless you were a commander. Just let's pause for a second here, Chris. Trying to work their troops up, by the way. We got a compliment from another viewer we're not even breathing heavily somehow so we must be in shape uh, we got Ken Rich watching we got our friend Clay Feeder watching it's so good to see you all um, joining us today and we have topped 700 live viewers at once it's our record for this anniversary so keep sharing it if we can we have got about three quarters or more of the way across the field of Pickett's Charge. Maybe we could look back to see. If we were to look back, we would see the detritus of battle all over the place here. We would see dead Confederates littering every piece of ground that we could see. It was a very costly advance. I never thought that remotely half of the Confederates got anywhere past the Emmitsburg Road. So maybe you're talking about you know a couple of thousand that might cross the Emmitsburg Road, and yet those dead are piling up. You can see the Elliott burial map. You know where the Confederates are buried, and they did not drag them very far so the confederates are really pushing here for the final attack as we continue to walk i would say we're somewhere on uh, richard brook garnett's line right now we're going to move across country a little bit for a little bit more poison ivy and loud noises over toward kemper let's have a moment of zen
to see the view getting better and better here. Let's do a 360 again, because we, we've only moved about 50 steps, but look at this. Here is the crest. If anybody doesn't think that Cemetery Ridge is a real deal ridge, it is. You can even see it rising above us with the clump of trees up there. I see the 69th Pennsylvania of Webb's Brigade, some guys who refuse to leave, so they bend back into the clump of trees. You've got George Gordon Meade on the horizon there. You've got the 72nd and 71st Pennsylvania. Too many monuments to describe. As we walk over this way, you can see a small rock out cropping called the slashing. Some uh, reports suggest that George Pickett might have gotten as far as that outcrop right there. It's more reasonable uh, that more accounts say he's seen at the Kadori farm um, and that's about the right place for a division commander. When you have 5,460 soldiers under your command, you can't be too close to the line. How can you command three brigades uh, if so? And again, another great view of Pickett's charge. Again, you wouldn't be able to take the whole thing and it's more than a mile wide. And for those of you who were here for Gettysburg 150, you know what I'm saying. You really couldn't um, see it all at once. Let's continue to make our way over toward our friends over here. Chris, anything to add? Yeah, let me just add on about George Pickett very quickly. Gary, you bring up a point that I love to, to bring up, and George Pickett is a division commander. A lot of people say, you know, he lost all three of his brigade commanders. Why is George Pickett not at the front? He must be a coward. No, that is not his job. His job is to be behind his lines, monitoring the progress and being in a place where his commanders can find him, and he can also find uh, his uh, commanding officer in case he needs to get reinforcements or shift men from the left to the right. So George Pickett should not have been to the front. And if you think he's a coward, he is not. He is going to go up the ramparts of Chapultepec with James Longstreet. He's going to take the flag from James Longstreet. He's wounded there during the Mexican War and Pickett is wounded down on the peninsula in 1862. It's really interesting, and I, I can't help but ascribe what little I know about quotes for George Washington, maybe to George Pickett. When George Washington, you know, was in all these actions, the Rev War, the French-Indian War, and all these actions, and there he was leading from the front, and one time says, well, how, why didn't you get wounded, General Washington? And he's like, I tried. I tried, like he wanted that military, you know, uh, feather in his cap and whatnot. And Pickett might have been better off getting wounded here. It certainly helped Dan Sickles, whom we talked about yesterday. Now, even before we reach the frontier, for right now, as you know, Faulkner says, for every boy not 14 years old, it's still the afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, and it is not yet over yet. And right now, it's not yet over. For right now, the Confederates are about to achieve their objective. Here comes Garnett and Kemper, and then here comes Armistead's brigade behind. And we're here. With with Wayne Motts again, um, as well as Jeremy Martin, um, who works with us at the Trust. And uh, Wayne, just let me just, just what do you have? Oh, this is Incredible. great, Gary. So you walking across Pickett's Charge, us here on Pickett's Charge ground, this is the actual diary carried by William Alam of Company H of the 18th Virginia Infantry Regiment in the Battle of Gettysburg. This diary was actually carried in Pickett's Charge, and it has July 3rd right here, Friday, July 3rd, where my finger is, and it said a great many wounded and myself among them. So Alam is badly wounded in the uh, thigh. He's 26 years old here at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. And according to newspaper articles we have, he went uh, was taken inside the Union lines. He was cared for. He was later exchanged. He survived the American Civil War. He goes to Tennessee. He was actually in Tennessee before the war, was a merchant there, went back to his native home in Virginia to enlist. But after the war, he goes back to Tennessee. And there he dies in 1904 at age 67. But this piece in the collection of the National Civil War Museum was right across this field, right here at this exact time, 157 years ago. And of course, the viewers, if they want to see more of this stuff, Gary, they got to come up to the National Civil War Museum, 39 miles away from the Gettysburg Battlefield up the state capitol and look at some of these things. Yeah, two of these things, you know, you, you might not be able to walk the field of Pickett's Charge along with this diary as we're being able to show you today. By the way, thanks, Wayne. I don't know yeah. other curators and CEOs of museums who do things like this. I mean, you can see clearly you're caring for the object and you're also bringing it back to where it was. But come here and as one of the viewers just said you have to walk Pickett's Charge to really understand it that's true another thing is while you're here take that 39 mile trek use your map app to find the National Civil War Museum I'm telling you they have stuff you have no idea about that we've never brought out here so it's just worth checking out in the meantime subscribe to their YouTube channel right after you subscribe to our the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel um, so you can see some of these things and I'll bet you'll be enticed to go now we're still on the Confederate line I think we're gonna hold off on your next artifact until we get over to the Yankee line here, but it's interesting. Even at this point, the Confederates are in great danger, not only from uh, 
um, projectiles, but also from, you know, the Yankees are literally bodily lifting Confederates over into their line, but the Southerners now are making the Yankees flee, right? You've got some of those Pennsylvanians, it gets too intense for them, they flee. And then you've got the reservists uh, under Armistead, they capture the stone wall up here. Let's get a little bit closer. At this same time, the Confederates are getting even farther, along with Johnston Pettigrew's men, where North Carolinians, Mississippians, and others are actually pushing over toward the Bryan Farm over there. So things are getting really close here. Some of the Confederates begin to leap over the wall, okay? You already, Chris already talked about Alonzo Cushing. He is bleeding out. He's about to be, he's, he's breathing his last. He will be awarded the Medal of Honor 150 years later, the last recipient here. But in the meantime, you've got Alexander Stuart Webb, a sort of new Brigadier General here here on the scene for this brigade, trying to lead reinforcements forward, do anything he can. And it's a great moment of promise for the Confederates. Um, Wayne, maybe if I may, since you're the Pickett's Charge author here, you know, you know, what, what is the high watermark here? What, what's the final, describe these final moments. The Confederates cross the wall with Armistead, what happens? All right, so when the Confederates reach this point right here along the stone wall at Cemetery Ridge, when they get to this point, this is really a mob of people. You've got men from Armstead, you've got men from Kemper, you've got men from Garnet, all together, Gary, right up into this situation, and it's just a mass of bodies. Meanwhile, you've got two guns of Cushing's battery right here on the stone wall with Cushing at his last breath trying to fend them off, and elements of the Philadelphia Brigade for Alexander Stuart Webb shooting infantry muskets right into this line. What a hellish amount of fire that must have been. When they got to this point, General Garnet is on his horse. He's still right up in front of this line when a rifle bullet from at least the best account we have struck him in the head. His body falls down. His horse, Red Eye, one of the most valuable horses in Longstreet's Corps, rides back. And if the smoke would not obscure his view, Armstead would have been able to see that coming up. Garnet's body goes down to the ground and today he's the only general officer in the confederate army killed in the american civil war where his remains are not positively identified somewhere he was buried in kind common i should say down along the emmitsburg road with the rest of the bodies today we don't know where richard garnett's final resting place is armstead's right behind him comes right up here and he turns to the lieutenant colonel of the 53rd virginia colonel raleigh martin and martin says you know, what are we going to do? Basically, Armstead said, well, Colonel, we can't stay here. And Martin looks at him and he says, then we'll go forward. Forward with the colors. And they take the 53rd Virginia. They mount on this stone wall. Armstead with his hat on his sword, cross right over there and punch a hole right into the 69th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Overwhelm Cushing's guns and get right up inside where the angle is today. Now, the Union Army is back along the roadway. They're going to bring up the 72nd Pennsylvania and then swing right around here it's over to where the Cops of Trees are located. Right where you see the Cops of Trees, you're going to have elements of the Union Army that are down here to the south. They're going to come right up in to try to plug this hole in the middle of this line right around 4 o'clock on July 3rd, 1863. That's great, Wayne. And if, if you know, you could freeze time right here, you would see something kind of like what you could see over there, Chris, if you don't mind panning over there. We see the Confederate colors just inside the Union line. We see a Union soldier up there. You would have seen both of those things right at this time. I don't know if this is about 3.30 or so on July 3rd, 1863. It is a mob, you know, but, but the several hundred, maybe 400, maybe it's more like 200 Confederates that actually crossed the wall. It is a moment of great promise. And if you could freeze time right Right there, they've achieved their objective, right? They have captured the position they were assigned to capture, but time does not stand still. And here come three, four, five, 10, 15,000 Union reinforcements. And it goes from a moment of great promise into by far Robert E. Lee's greatest disaster, not even close. Uh, to anything else. Uh, half of the Confederates who made the attack made it back to Seminary Ridge about an hour later. The Southerners lost how many? 23 battle flags in this attack, more than they'd lost in the entire war to that point combined. The Union troops were so happy they're chanting Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg to say they are getting the Southerners back for the wholesale destruction they had, you know, received from them just seven months earlier, about a hundred and some miles away from here. It was an absolute, totally happy moment for the Union who finally had a Avenge Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and so many other losses and Robert E. Lee went back to the other side and some people said that maybe the Yankees should have counterattacked at this point, right? It's easy to say that, especially from the cheap seats, because that's what you do, right? You follow up a retreating foe, but 
you know, why do you want the Union to attack across the same open fields that they just slaughtered the Confederates on? I don't blame them. And it's not like you get an attack like that going in five minutes. It's going to be an hour. Lee is far from beaten. Lee is an extraordinarily dangerous opponent um, uh, against the Union Army at this point. So they do not attack. And the next day, through the pouring rain, on Independence Day, at least for some, the day Vicksburg fell 1,400 miles away, through the pouring rain, Lee sat over there and did not leave and said, come on, Meade, attack me. I dare you, hoping he can even the odds. Lee, who you see across the field, and Meade, who you see over there, face each other, and Meade does not take the bait. That night, Lee will go back into Virginia, nine, I'm sorry, retreat. Nine days later, he gets back into Virginia. And some people, I mean politicians, blame George Gordon Meade for letting Lee escape from this position. Um, and, and of course, you know, I don't know that Lee so much escaped. You know, why is it that any other general couldn't bring Lee to bear? Why did it take Grant fighting every day for 10 months to bring Lee to bear, even when he outnumbered him two to one and Lee was practically starving, okay? Lee's a very dangerous guy and you don't bag 50,000 men under Robert E. Lee very easily. So this is the way it go, goes. Lee tenders his resignation saying, I can't achieve my objectives. And Jefferson Davis says, no, no way. I'm laughing at your resignation. I'm not letting you go. Meade tenders his resignation and Lincoln says, whoa, whoa, it wasn't that bad. You did win after all. And both these guys will go on to command these respective armies until the end of the Civil War. Okay, but of course there's two more terrible years of war and it really escalates from there and I think you know the story. So let me pause for a second to both thank you for watching um, and we'll try to catch up on some of your comments because we haven't been keeping up and see if Chris or Wayne have anything to add at this point. I just got one more thing I'd yes, like you to do. show, uh, Gary, and let's circle around, just circle around a little bit down here. Back over my left shoulder to the right of the screen, you'll see a granite memorial down by the tree that's pointed. That's a monument to the 19th Maine. One of the officers here in the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, Captain Joseph Spaulding, this is the um, tree foal, which is the symbol for the Second Union Army Corps. Remember Joseph Hooker standardized these symbols. The enlisted soldiers wore them on their hats. They were usually color-coded, red, white, and blue for 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Division. And the officers wore pins, in many cases, on their chest. This is the actual Corps badge of, the, of uh, Captain Joseph A. Spaulding, or Joseph W. Spaulding, excuse me, of Company A of the 19th Maine. This would have been what he actually wore at Gettysburg. He wow. later became the Lieutenant Colonel. So this was on the ground here 157 years ago, taken today out of the collections of the National Civil War Museum at Harrisburg, on the field in your hands, Gary Edelman. And Joseph Spaulding died in 1919 and he's buried up in Maine. He lived to be 76 years old after the Battle of Gettysburg, a very well-known officer here, but that's an actual piece. So now you've seen a Confederate piece that walked across Pickett's Charge, and you've seen a Union piece from the collections of the National Civil War Museum here in the Union Defense. I just, uh, there's something special about holding something from the past. I mean, the dirt was here and everything, but this has got his name in it. It's got his name in it, and there's something special about that. In that case, in the case of the diary, it has his plight. You know, it said exactly what was happening to him. So, Wayne, thanks so much for bringing these precious items out. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear earlier, we took a weird path over here because we have hit this year after year on the Confederate line, on the Union line. So we thought we would go between the lines for this particular live. We'll refer you back to Gettysburg 155, 156, and the scores of videos we have shot at Gettysburg over the years here for more detail about the Confederate line and about the actual Union line here. Um, we really appreciate everybody watching. Chris, anything else to add? The only thing I want to add, Gary, is thanks everyone for watching these uh, videos this week. We've seen a lot of you in person and thank you for staying away from us uh, <laughs> but during this time of COVID. And the only thing else I want to add was uh, you know, we've had a blast and uh, we hope that you continue to keep sharing this. And thanks to Wayne, Carol, Chris Mikowski, Tim Smith, uh, everybody who was part of this. So please go back to our Facebook and YouTube channel. That'll make Andy very happy and Connor very happy back in the uh, in the office if you'll share these and if you'll like our pages and it makes me happy that our connectivity was pretty good for this week. Good, good. Maybe it'll cut out right now. So make sure also you look out for more uh, at, at this Facebook page and on YouTube. A lot of videos that we haven't had time to post yet. So you're going to see some videos tomorrow and on Sunday, Monday, and maybe even into Tuesday. And of course, we post two or three or five videos every week all year on Facebook or battlefields.org or YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for spreading the education message uh, that all American citizens should spread. And thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.